At the end of Breaking Bad, we watched a character achieve his stated goal of amassing a fortune for his family. Then we watched him die alone, hated by anyone he ever knew or loved. Walter White may have achieved some small amount of redemption by saving Jesse and finally admitting the truth. I did it for me. I liked it. But all in all, the moral seemed to say it was too late for Walter White. Vince Gilligan's goal was to turn an average man evil, and by the end, he succeeded. He showed us all the steps involved, and showed us both sides of the equation. The prize, wealth and thrills. The cost, dying alone. Once Breaking Bad ended and Better Call Saul approached with a similar promise, turning Jimmy McGill into Saul Goodman, you could ask, what more is there to say on the matter? Why do we need to see another man morally erode until there's nothing left? By the end of the series, I think the answer was made clear. First, it served as a broader cautionary tale. If Breaking Bad advised against the perils of pride and ego, Better Call Saul expanded the tale to show other, more complicated paths to evil. Mike, Gus, Kim, Chuck, and Jimmy all suffered different flaws which pushed them toward self-destructive or just plain destructive behavior. The show also explored relationships so much more and how we shape each other, often in unexpected and unintentional ways. Second, and especially important for the ending, Better Call Saul didn't just turn Jimmy McGill into Saul Goodman, but also asked, how do you turn him back? That's the key question tackled by the Better Call Saul finale. Throughout the series, Jimmy McGill developed a dangerous coping mechanism, one where he deals with trauma by not dealing with it. In season three, after Chuck's meltdown in court, Jimmy visited the malpractice insurance office. He was there to try and cancel his own, since he wouldn't be practicing law for a year. Then he saw an opportunity to hurt Chuck, and he took it by slyly letting them know about his brother's humiliation in court. After that, Chuck's insurance cost and the effect he would have on HHM's overall costs were too much. Howard pushed him into retirement and Chuck spiraled, taking his own life. In season four, Howard confesses to Jimmy and Kim that he believes Chuck's death was a suicide and that it may have been his fault for pushing Chuck into retirement over the insurance issue. That catches Jimmy's attention. What about the insurance? It was uh, our malpractice insurance. They found out about Chuck's condition and raised our rates. After an episode of barely speaking and just generally looking shaken, Jimmy's demeanor changes drastically. The moment he learns that his final move against Chuck was the thing to push him over the line, Jimmy turns into a different person. Well, Howard, I guess that's your cross to bear. He gets up, feeds the fish with a smile, and whistles to himself as he makes coffee. Rather than deal with the traumatic realization that he played a role in his brother's death, Jimmy instead puts on an act. An act which says everything's okay. Sound familiar? After the tragedy of Howard Hamlin, and especially after losing Kim, Jimmy put on a similar act. Only this time it had a name. Saul Goodman. And it would last for years. In his final confession, Jimmy acknowledged this directly after bringing up what happened to Howard. Kim had the guts to start over. She left town, but I'm the one who ran away. He ran away from himself by adopting a false persona. And what's so wrong with that? From the flash forward after Kim left him, we get our only real glimpse into Saul's personal life. And what we see is sad. We see someone doing everything they can to ensure they are never alone with their thoughts or feelings. Jimmy knows that's when things get painful. Like in the season four finale, Winner, Jimmy is forced to sit on the board for Charles McGill's memorial scholarship. He watches Howard and the others pass over Christy Esposito thanks to one black mark on her record. This, of course, reminds Jimmy of himself. So he gives her an impassioned speech about cutting corners and making everyone else suffer despite their looking down on her. Once again, of course, he's talking about himself. Afterward, in a rare show of genuine emotion, Jimmy sits in his car alone and suddenly sobs. As Saul Goodman, he'd never allow that. 
Even in the shower, he doesn't give himself a second to be alone. Instead, he's already shouting into his Bluetooth earpiece. This continues on his car ride into work. And when he's home, when there's no more work to be done, he has a steady stream of escorts to distract him. We only see one, but the bowl of Nutrigrain bars tells us everything we need to know. In that same flash forward, there's also this line. Oh, that's my Xanax guy. Uh, tell him yes and today. The most blatant signal that underneath the facade, Saul Goodman is not okay. He's taking medication used to treat anxiety and panic disorders. And there are other signs too, like the copy of the time machine he apparently kept all this time. In the finale, we learn this was Chuck's book. That alone would be enough to signify that Chuck was still on Jimmy's mind to some extent. Otherwise, why would he have held on to that book? Why would we have found him reading it in episode 2 of the final season? And why would it be found among Saul Goodman's things in the cold open of the final season's premiere? Further, the finale teaches us that Jimmy uses the idea of time travel as a circuitous way to discuss regret. You are talking about regrets, so if you want to ask about regrets, just ask about regrets. Jimmy has regrets about Chuck, Howard, Kim, Walt, and more, I'm sure. Being Saul Goodman doesn't make that all go away. It's just a tactic of avoidance, a way to not think about it or feel the pain. And for a while, it does work to keep Jimmy distracted by feeding him a steady stream of victories. Jimmy loves to scam, and that too has long been a part of his coping mechanism. We saw it all the way back in season one. After learning Chuck was the one blocking him from HHM, Jimmy returned to Cicero and went on a week-long scamming bender with Marco. Since childhood, Jimmy's worldview was that you're either a wolf or sheep. After watching his father die a sheep, he did his best to show the world he was a wolf. And after feeling rejected by the person he respected most, Chuck, Jimmy reacted like a cornered animal. He was no longer just a wolf. Now, he was a wolf out for blood. At the end of season one, he wonders to Mike why they didn't take the Kettleman's stolen $1.6 million for themselves. By stealing from thieves, they'd have never been caught. Well, I know what stopped me. And you know what? It's never stopping me again. Put another way, Jimmy is done doing the right thing. If the world was out to screw him and reject him, he would answer the world in kind. He would use his abilities to cut corners and take advantage. He would play the game and measure his success using their own scoring system, money. And as we saw, he amassed plenty of it as Saul Goodman. As Saul Goodman, he's a wolf and a winner, which makes it a bit easier to forget Jimmy McGill, a bit easier to forget all that pain and trauma. His journey was, of course, a little more complicated than this, with plenty of starts and stops along the way. Otherwise, the series would have been over after season one. But that's where the trend began. And after the ultimate rejection from Kim, leaving Jimmy wounded and alone, he did his best to fully embrace the Saul Goodman role morning, day, and night. Ultimately, Jimmy ended up in a prison of his own making, trapped in the dishonest world of Saul Goodman. Just like Gus was trapped in his quest for revenge, Mike in his resigned existence as a gangster, or Kim in the meek shell of her old self. The lesson? Living immorally or dishonestly means living in a spiritual jail cell. And the longer you indulge that life, the more likely it is to end up killing you. See Nacho, Gus, Mike, or Walt. And if it doesn't kill you, that spiritual prison will eventually take physical form. As it did with Jimmy, sending him to Omaha under the assumed identity of Gene Takovic. Suddenly, he wasn't just on the run from himself, but from the law too. And now, someone who loved to be in the spotlight had to do nothing but hide and make himself as small as possible. Heading into the final stretch of episodes, it was hard to imagine a happy ending for Jimmy. But if there was one, it would have to involve Jimmy reconciling with himself. We'd have to see him stop running from his trauma and instead face it. But how does someone make that change? Jimmy isn't Jesse Pinkman. 
in the captivity of villains waiting to be rescued. He's just a guy who needs to break from his own patterns and make the right choice. What gets someone to do that? In the finale, we find out, and it's easy to pinpoint the moment it happens. On that airplane, on the way to Albuquerque, New Mexico, Jimmy learns a little more about Kim's confession from Bill. She is unlikely to face any criminal charges. But, Bill points out, Cheryl Hamlin is shopping for lawyers. Kim is likely to face severe civil charges. That fact makes Jimmy think. And when Bill returns from the men's room, Jimmy hatches one more scheme, one that will get Kim to Albuquerque, where she'll witness his own confession. Up to this moment, things looked bleak for Jimmy. When Jeff recognized him in the cab, Jimmy had to use some Saul Goodman tactics to protect himself. But scamming again was like an alcoholic taking one last sip. It's never really the last. And then Jimmy's phone call to Kim pushes him over the edge. Years earlier, he responded to her rejection by fully embracing the Saul Goodman persona. This phone call has a similar effect. Rather than being happy to hear from her ex-husband, she can hardly speak and can only offer that Jimmy should turn himself in. And she's happy he's alive. Jeff woke up Jimmy's love of scamming, and Kim reopened an old wound. So Jimmy copes, the same way he coped when he was betrayed by Chuck years earlier. He goes on a scamming bender, though this time he doesn't have Marco, Kim, or Walt as partners in crime. So he settles for Jeff and Buddy. Season 6, Episode 11, Breaking Bad, tries to ensure we understand the tragedy of this choice by pointing out that it is a repeat of a cycle which has trapped Jimmy for years. The events of Breaking Bad, the series, represent some of the worst choices Jimmy ever made. Getting involved with Walter White meant crossing perhaps unforgivable moral and legal lines, and it meant destroying any chance at living any kind of normal life. If anything was going to shake Jimmy McGill out of his spell so he could see where he went wrong, you would think this would have to be it. But as the episode Breaking Bad showed us, Jimmy instead repeats the same mistakes. Walt and Jesse kidnapped Saul, but he saw potential in them and went on to help build Heisenberg's meth empire. Jeff and Buddy intimidate Gene, lording over him their knowledge of his past, but he saw potential in them, and upped their game too, from shoplifting to identity theft. To be clear, we're talking about different types of potential. In Walt, he saw talent, and someone who could make really good meth. In Jeff and Buddy, he saw a couple of tools he could use for his own ends. Finally, Better Call Saul parallels two moments where Jimmy crossed a threshold. In their latest scam, Buddy gets cold feet after learning their mark is terminally ill. So Jimmy insists on breaking into the house himself. Jeff warns that the man will soon wake up. There's a high likelihood Jimmy will be caught, and he doesn't need the money. Despite those warnings, Jimmy breaks into the man's house. The episode intercuts this with Jimmy entering Walter White's school, where we know from Breaking Bad he will make his pitch that they work together. This is despite Mike's warnings that Walt is an amateur. In both cases, he ignores logical warnings and makes a choice that will ultimately be his undoing. But why? Why does Jimmy make the same self-destructive choice again? We know Jimmy is addicted to the thrill of scamming, and that thrill is most palatable when you're on the brink of getting caught, but just barely getting away with it. And we know he has a hard time admitting defeat or pulling the plug inches from the finish line. Just look at the season 5 episode, Wexler v. McGill. He and Kim hatch a scheme against Kevin Wachtell to ensure Mr. Acker gets to keep his land. The night before they pull it off, Kim visits Jimmy to call it off. He hesitantly agrees, but ultimately couldn't fulfill his promise. He blindsided her by executing the scam anyway, despite her wishes. Once Jimmy is in the man's house, it looks like he might actually get away clean. Then, he decides to stay just a bit longer. Why? It could just be that he wants to savor that feeling of getting away with it a bit longer. Or, like Saul's holding on to the time machine, it could be another sign of his conscience 
bubbling up from beneath the Saul Goodman facade. Perhaps some part of Jimmy is tired of running. He recognizes that he's trapped in this self-destructive cycle and wants it all to end. So he pushes things a little further, putting himself in danger, hoping to get caught. But when he almost does get caught, the other part of Jimmy, the part that's afraid, wakes up and he runs. Back home, he saw Goodman again, dispensing legal advice to a desperate criminal on the phone. And of course, we all remember what happens next. Jimmy at Marion's house, threatening her with a phone cord. But in that moment, we're once again reminded that this vicious persona, the version of Jimmy that can threaten to kill an elderly woman, is an act. Sure, acting as Saul Goodman, he could advise Walt and Jesse to kill Badger or Hank. But taking a life with his own hands is not something Jimmy McGill is capable of. And maybe there is that part of him which wants to get caught. It made him stay in that man's house a little too long. And here, it made him drop the life alert system, letting Marion make that fateful call. Then, just like in the man's house, the moment passes. Jimmy gets scared sober and he runs. Though he's quickly caught and finally finds himself on the wrong side of the legal system. At first, he's utterly defeated and doesn't know what to do with himself. Then, a vulgar joke etched into the wall of his holding cell reminds him who he is. He's a lawyer. He is Saul Goodman, and he fully commits to the role. He looks into Marie Schrader's eyes and plays the victim. He tries to parlay Howard Hamlin's tragic end for some mint chocolate chip ice cream. And as Saul Goodman... He wins, negotiating down from life plus 160 to seven and a half in a country club prison. It's a clear win for Saul Goodman. Until he has that conversation with Bill. He'd already heard from the prosecutor that Kim confessed. That certainly got Jimmy thinking, trying to make sense of it. And talking to Bill, he quickly does. He asks what the DA will do, and Bill explains that with no witnesses or physical evidence, probably nothing. And Jimmy says, okay, as if suddenly it all makes sense. After all, it was easy for Kim to confess if there were no consequences. Then Bill sets the record straight. Kim didn't just confess to the DA. She also took her sworn affidavit straight to Howard Hamlin's widow, opening herself up to a civil suit. Her confession was real and had real consequences. Suddenly, as Peter Gould put it in an interview with Variety, that seven-and-a-half-year deal, which Saul was kind of happy about, turned to ashes in his mouth. Hearing of Kim's genuine confession shakes Jimmy to his core. It's the thing that finally pierces the Saul Goodman exterior and tells him he's been looking at the wrong scoreboard. How much money he can make and how much he can get away with clearly hasn't made him happy. His conversations with Walt and Mike about time machines tell us he's filled with regret he doesn't know how to voice. His overstimulated life as Saul Goodman tells us he's constantly fighting a battle against inner turmoil. But what's the alternative? The world is wolves and sheep, right? If he's not Saul Goodman taking constant advantage of the people around him, then he's Charles McGill Sr. getting fleeced by hungry wolves. Or maybe he's Chuck McGill, constantly doing the quote-unquote right thing, but with ulterior motives, flaunting superiority and putting others down due to envy, resentment, and pride. Then this happens. This person Jimmy loves and respects did something which on the surface seems self-destructive. What's Kim's angle? What's her ulterior motive? Jimmy can't find one. It's Kim Wexler confessing and bearing her soul plain and simple. Jimmy's worldview collapses in front of him. He was wrong. Suddenly, that quiet voice which told Jimmy to drop the life alert button or stay a little longer in that man's house grows louder. Now, it tells Jimmy to stop running and confess. If Kim can do it, so can he. But it would feel incomplete if she wasn't there with him. Maybe he needs her there so he can feel strong enough to go through with it. Or maybe he just wants Kim to see him confess so he can show her that he's better now. So he makes up a lie about having more testimony, which implicates Kim personally. That's likely the only way he can get her into that courtroom when he confesses. And when he takes a stand, he does exactly that. 
admitting to making all of Walter White's crimes possible. Then he looks back at Kim and in her eyes sees that there's more to confess. He hasn't gone far enough. So he talks about Howard and Chuck. Bill reminds him that what happened with Chuck wasn't even a crime. But for Jimmy, this isn't just about the law. It's about taking responsibility for all the things he did wrong. It's about finally facing his trauma and guilt so he can stop running. After Kim made her confession, the walls of her mental prison began to crumble. She felt guilty over what happened with Howard, so she deprived herself of her life's passion. She would no longer practice the law or use her talents to help those who need it. But in the finale, we see her take on some volunteer work at a law office. That's the beginning of the real Kim Wexler finally waking up. Making his confession and accepting the consequences may do the same thing for Jimmy. Unfortunately, his crimes went a bit further than Kim's, actively participating in the building of a meth empire, including all the death and destruction that comes with it. His consequences are more severe than a civil suit. Jimmy ends the series facing 86 years in prison, and although he's reclaimed his identity as James McGill, the world will never see him as anything other than Saul Goodman. Except for Kim, who in their final scene together calls him Jimmy. Hi, Jimmy. So much of this series has been about love between these two characters. The loss of that love is what finally had Jimmy fulfill his destiny from Breaking Bad, turning him into Saul Goodman. In the finale, although they likely won't be together in any traditional sense, he does win back some version of that love, and he is finally dealing with his emotions. Is he fully healed? Probably not, but he's at least taken the first step, acknowledging his regrets, crimes, guilt, and wrongdoings. Is it a happy ending? Well, in my view, it's as happy as can be given the circumstances. For Jimmy to unburden himself and have a chance at true happiness, he had to give a true confession, and a true confession requires one to face the appropriate punishment. So, knowing all the awful things Saul did in Breaking Bad meant that the happiest possible ending to this series is one where he pays for his crimes while rediscovering his soul. And I think that's the ending we got. To be clear, by the way, when I mention things like confessions or Jimmy's soul, I am borrowing religious terms. Though personally, I think of them as psychological shorthand. Jimmy rediscovering his soul means Jimmy feeling at peace with himself and feeling like he's living properly. And I think that's in line with what Better Call Saul tried to communicate with its finale. Just take a look at the lyrics of the song, All Things Are Possible, which plays as Saul enters the courtroom. I met God one morning. My soul was feeling bad. Heart heavy laden, I had a fire, doubt ahead. He lifted all of my burdens. Right now my soul is feeling glad. Yes, all things are possible, if you'll only believe. After Jimmy and Kim's reunion in the prison, we get one more scene, where she walks off and Jimmy shoots her those classic finger guns. Peter Gould has talked about why he included that last scene. They had considered ending on Jimmy and Kim in the prison, but that felt dishonest, because it implied they were together now. And although it's valid to imagine they keep in contact after this, the reality is they'll likely never again have what they had earlier in the series. So ending on a shot hearkening back to episode one felt disingenuous. Instead, they ended with them apart, but acknowledging each other, and acknowledging the good times they had. That's how I read Jimmy McGill's finger guns at the end, basically saying, yeah, we did a lot of bad, but let's not forget some of the fun we had. And apparently they did shoot a version of the scene where Kim does the finger guns back, and some people claim that she is subtly returning the gesture if you look closely at her fingers. I'm not sure if I see it or not, but either way, just based on the way they interacted in the prison, in my mind, she feels the same way as Jimmy, whether her fingers show it or not. Now, despite everything I'm saying, I'm sure some of you are thinking, okay, 
I'm going to stop you right there. Don't try and sell me this nonsense that Saul going to jail for nearly a century is a happy ending. Okay, I hear you. And hey, there is some good news. First, although I'd partially consider it karmic punishment that Jimmy will always be Saul Goodman to the rest of the world, it also works in his favor. On that bus ride and in the prison kitchen, you can see he's well-liked and getting along just fine. He'll certainly suffer a lack of freedom as a prisoner, but his life won't be a living hell. In some sense, he's getting just the right amount of punishment he deserves. Second, Kim seems to be back to her old self, so it's easy to imagine that she may try to, legitimately, shorten Jimmy's sentence. Ray Seahorn likes to believe that's what Kim would do, and even Peter Gould himself has coyly suggested something similar. In his interview with The Hollywood Reporter, he said this, It felt right to have them apart and also deal with the truth that he's in prison, and he's going to be for quite a while. Whether or not it's the full sentence, we can all fantasize and think about what might happen next. And in a creator Q&A with AMC, he said this, And I don't know about you, but I feel like this guy is so clever, I kind of wonder how long he's really going to be in prison. So hey, sounds like there's a good chance Jimmy will get out a bit sooner and enjoy some freedom. Finally, if you're looking for some hope at revisiting this world one day, Gould said this in that same Q&A. Certainly never say never. And I think if you watch this episode, Kim Wexler seems like she's got more to do. That's for sure. And I think that about wraps it up. Personally, I could not have left this series more satisfied. I loved taking this journey with Jimmy and Kim, and I thought they masterfully earned the bittersweet ending they gave us. And if you're not ready to leave the world of Walter White and Jimmy McGill just yet, subscribe to the One Take Podcast channel. We're doing a Breaking Bad rewatch and we'll cover the experience there with roughly one episode per season. In that rewatch, we're not just revisiting the series, but also seeing how our viewing of it changes after seeing Better Call Saul. And if you want more than one podcast episode per season, check out our Patreon, where we'll be doing some extra episodes. All those links are in the description. With that, please like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon if you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching, and see you on the next One Take.